Welcome to NTD News. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Here are today's top stories. Senator Bernie Sanders heads into Super Tuesday with a delegate lead, and Joe Biden receives backing from three former candidates. Israel's prime minister wins the nation's third election in less than a year, but he falls short of getting a majority. Will it be enough to solve Israel's political divide? The Supreme Court rejects an attempt to slow the ban of bump stocks for rifles, but the matter is still far from a final ruling. And Vice President Mike Pence warns that a coronavirus vaccine may take up to a year to get through trials, but treatments to help alleviate patient symptoms will be available within months. Just in, the Federal Reserve, in a rare emergency step, cut short-term rates by half a percentage point today to protect the U.S. economy from the growing impact of the global coronavirus outbreak. The half-point cut is the biggest in more than a decade and prompted a jump on the major stock indexes. In a statement, the central bank said the committee is closely monitoring developments and their implications for the economic outlook and will use its tools and act as appropriate to support the economy. The decision was unanimous among policymakers. The current short-term rates are now between 1 and 1.25 percent, a range not seen since mid-2017. And just this morning, powerful tornadoes ripped through Tennessee, left at least 19 people dead and tens of thousands without power. State authorities have declared a level three state of emergency. We'll bring you updates as they come in. And now to Super Tuesday. It's an important day for the remaining Democratic presidential candidates. Senator Bernie Sanders is starting off with more delegates than any other candidate. And former mayor Mike Bloomberg's name is on the ballot for the first time in the race. It's a big day for the Democratic presidential election candidates. It's Super Tuesday. Roughly a third of all pledged delegates are up for grabs and it may determine a clear leader in the field for nomination. Joe Biden heads into the day coming off a big weekend win in South Carolina. Folks, you know, just a few days ago, the press and the pundits declared this campaign dead. But South Carolina had something to say about it. Former rival Amy Klobuchar endorsed Joe Biden's presidential candidacy on Monday after bailing out of the race. Mayor Pete Buttigieg also gave his support to Biden at a separate event. Then another endorsement from another former candidate, Beto O'Rourke. But Biden still faces a challenge from former New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg among voters who want to nominate a moderate. And then there's the progressives. So to all of Amy and Pete's millions of supporters, the door is open. Come on in. Sanders said Biden's vision for the future of the nation is wrong, while he intends to bring a political revolution. Senator Elizabeth Warren agreed that the U.S. needs revolutionary changes and said that makes Biden unsuitable for the job. Nominating a man who says we do not need any fundamental change in this country will not meet this moment. Supporters of Warren share the sentiment, making them unlikely to support a candidate like Biden should Warren drop out of the race. I like that she is a strong progressive with an actual liberal vision for the country. Five candidates, Biden, Bloomberg, Sanders, Warren, and U.S. Representative Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii remain in the running for the Democratic nomination. Bloomberg is making his ballot box debut, having not competed in the first four state nominating contests. He maintains that he is the only candidate that can take on President Trump. Fourteen states will cast their vote on Super Tuesday. In Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is leading after a cliffhanger election. Television exit polls show him two seats short of a governing majority in parliament. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared victory on Monday in Israel's election, the third in less than a year, but television exit polls showed he was still short of a governing majority in parliament. A win for Netanyahu after inconclusive ballots in April and September would be a testament to the political durability of Israel's longest-serving leader, who fought the latest campaign under the shadow of a looming corruption trial. 
Netanyahu's latest re-election bid has been complicated by his indictment on charges of bribery, breach of trust, and fraud over allegations he granted state favors worth millions of dollars to Israeli media barons in return for favorable press coverage and that he wrongfully received gifts. The first trial of a sitting prime minister in Israel is due to begin on March 17th. Netanyahu denies any wrongdoing. During the campaign, Netanyahu's main challenger, Benny Gantz, called the prime minister the defendant and has accused him of seeking to retain power to promote legislation that would bar authorities from putting a serving prime minister on trial. In a speech at his Blue and White Party's election headquarters, Gantz stopped short of conceding defeat, saying the election could result in another deadlock. The State Department is placing a cap on the number of employees that can work for Chinese state-run media agencies in the U.S. The move comes in response to the Chinese Communist Party's recent crackdown on the free press, including the disappearance of citizen journalists who were covering the coronavirus in China. The Department of State is limiting how many people can work for Chinese state-run media in the U.S. The personnel cap is meant to encourage China to act fairly to U.S. and foreign press in China, as well as respect freedom of speech. One analyst says Chinese reporters in the U.S. enjoy free speech, but that's not the case for American reporters in China. Oh, their uh, daily work was uh, very restricted by the uh, Chinese government. but. Uh, those reporters in U.S., basically, they can't do anything they want, just like an American reporter. The U.S. has issued 3,000 visas to Chinese nationals who work in the media industry since 2015, but there are only 75 reporters working for American news agencies in China. Last month, the Chinese regime expelled three Wall Street Journal reporters, reportedly as punishment for an opinion piece that criticized the regime's response to the coronavirus outbreak. The U.S. government should uh, uh, take some action to tell Chinese regime, you cannot do this because it's, it's not fair. According to the State Department, China is cracking down on freedom of the press, evidenced by the disappearance of journalists covering the coronavirus in China. The department says the personnel cap is not a result of the content these agencies create, but to spur Beijing to have a more reciprocal approach to independent press in China. The Supreme Court has rejected an attempt to postpone the Trump administration's ban on bump stocks. One of the justices indicated the court will observe how lower courts handle the issue and may pick it up again later. President Trump ordered the ban in 2018. He asked the attorney general to outlaw the bump stock device, which allows semi-automatic rifles to fire rapidly like machine guns. They're mostly illegal for civilians. The devices received unprecedented media attention after Las Vegas shooter Stephen Paddock used them in killing 58 and injuring hundreds more in 2017. The Firearms Policy Foundation and other plaintiffs sued in federal court to try to reverse the bump stock ban. They aim to temporarily stop it from going into effect while the case works its way through the courts. But the District of Columbia District Court refused to pause the rule, which went into effect in March 2019. The D.C. Appeals Court affirmed the decision in April. The Supreme Court last year refused to pause the ban as well. While requests to put the rule on hold have failed, the case is yet to receive a final decision. Apple has agreed to pay up to $500 million to settle a lawsuit. The company has been accused of quietly slowing down older iPhones as it launches new models to encourage owners to buy replacement phones or batteries. The preliminary proposed class action settlement was disclosed on Friday. It now requires approval by U.S. District Judge in California. It calls for Apple to pay consumers $25 per iPhone, which may be adjusted up or down, depending on how many iPhones are eligible. But the company faces a minimum total payout of $310 million. Court papers show Apple denied wrongdoing and settled the nationwide case to avoid the burdens and costs of litigation. Friday's settlement covers U.S. owners of the iPhone 6, 6 Plus, 6S, 6S Plus, 7, 7 Plus, or SE that ran the iOS 10.2.1 or later operating system. 
It also covers U.S. owners of the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus that ran iOS 11.2 or later before December 21, 2017. Lawyers for the consumers described the settlement as fair, reasonable and adequate. Following an initial outcry over slow iPhones, Apple apologized and lowered the price for replacement batteries to $29 from $79. Vice President Mike Pence reassures the nation that the risk from the coronavirus remains low, despite the U.S. death toll rising to six. He says the vaccine may take longer than expected, but therapeutics should be readily available by summer. It's all hands on deck, according to Vice President Mike Pence and the Coronavirus Task Force. Four more people have died from the virus, bringing the total to six in the U.S., Pence said the vaccine is coming along, but trials mean it may be up to a year before it's available. Therapeutics, however, will come quicker. The nature of trials, as the experts have explained to us, is that the vaccine might yet not be available till late this year or early next, but the therapeutics, uh, giving relief to people that contract the coronavirus, could literally be available by this summer or early fall. Pence said governors dealing with cases of the coronavirus in their state have reported good cooperation with health officials and local health care providers. He said it's creating a seamless response to the virus spread. He added that the task force is paying close attention to the behavior of the outbreak overseas. He said they are watching the cases. Uh, the president is very clear. We're, we're going to follow the facts and listen to the experts every step of the way. Speaking at a rally in North Carolina, President Trump said partisan attacks were a divisive force that are not helping the U.S. response to the coronavirus. But the political attacks from some of the Democrats really must stop. We've got to all work together on this one to safeguard our people. We're going to safeguard our people, the United States. The main takeaway from the White House Virus Task Force is that this is a time to use common sense but the threat to the nation remains low. And another new development, airports across South Korea and Italy will conduct screenings of all passengers to the U.S. to prevent the spread of the virus. Both countries have been hit hard by the outbreak. And within the U.S., state and city officials are figuring out ways to prevent the coronavirus from spreading locally. Hundreds and even thousands in some states are actively being monitored for infection. Various states across the country are working hard to prevent the coronavirus from spreading. Six people have died in the U.S., all in Washington state. Five of them were all from the same county. In the United States as a whole, there are over 100 confirmed cases. Four firefighters in Irvine, California, left quarantine after a person they transported to the hospital tested negative for the coronavirus. They self-quarantined at the fire station and hadn't been in contact with anyone else. Across the state, 8,400 people are being monitored for the virus. New Hampshire confirmed its first coronavirus case after a local returned from a trip to Italy. Italy has the most coronavirus cases in Europe. Arizona health officials are monitoring 250 people for potential coronavirus infections. Officials say they can do up to 450 coronavirus tests per day. The mayor of San Antonio said those under quarantine at a nearby military base will not be released until further notice. A mall in the city closed for a deep cleaning after someone who visited was later found to have the coronavirus. The woman tested negative twice before she was released from a Texas facility and then later tested positive. The University of Washington and the University of Oregon have said they will continue normal operations despite multiple schools and school districts around them closing because of the virus. A school worker in Oregon has a presumptive case of the virus with no known origin. Another mode of transportation joined airlines in making policy changes to deal with the coronavirus outbreak. Amtrak announced on its website it is now waiving change fees on travel reservations. It points to customers concerned about the virus. In its notice, the railroad service says it is not facing any current travel restrictions because of the outbreak, but understands its customers may have concerns. For now, this waiver applies to tickets purchased by April 30th. Amtrak says it will continue to monitor the coronavirus situation closely and adjust the policy as necessary. And coming up, rising anger in South Korea as coronavirus cases continue to increase. Some are calling for murder charges against a religious group's leader. Find out why when we return.
When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and bited out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. South Korea had more than 4,800 coronavirus cases as of last night and rising anger against a religious group from the public since more than half of South Korea's cases are linked to it. Leaders in Seoul are even pressing for murder charges against some of the group's leaders. This is the man Seoul's government wants to see charged with homicide. Lee Man-hee, leader of the religious group Shincheonji, apologized Monday, claiming the group had tried to stem the spread of the novel coronavirus. This is not the time to scrutinize who's right or wrong. This is the time for everyone to do their best to resolve the situation. Authorities disagree. Seoul City has filed a legal complaint against Lee and 12 group leaders, saying some members refused to be tested. Leadership provided insufficient information on members and hampered the work of health authorities. Accusations previously made by the mayor of the hardest-hit city, Daegu. More than half of all cases in South Korea are linked to this one group. The group says it has around 245,000 members, more than 30,000 of them outside of South Korea, around 3,000 in the United States. Sinchonji admits some of the leaders of those international branches did come to South Korea mid-January of this year for an annual gathering. Do Young Kim says he was director of international affairs for the group until 2017 when he left. He wants authorities to look beyond Korea's borders when investigating the group. This is not just a Korean issue because since those people from overseas all gathered together at once, what happens is we don't know how many of those people who went back overseas are infected as well. Current director of international missions at the group, Kim Shing Chang, says members did come in from the U.S. and China in January, but claims none are unwell. And now on the coronavirus in Europe. Following Italy, Germany has the highest number of infections on the continent. With nearly 190 cases, almost all states in Europe's biggest economy are affected. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin has more on this. Today, coronavirus infections have reached almost all of Germany's 16 states, with only three of them without any cases. According to Germany's Center for Disease Control, the Robert Koch Institute, a total of 180 cases are now confirmed. More than half of them are in the western state of North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany's most populous state. German Health Minister Jens Spahn said on Monday it's up to local authorities whether they decide to cancel large events due to the spread of the coronavirus. I've been reading that the federal minister is the one to request large events to be cancelled, but the Infection Protection Act says the decision is in the hands of local authorities. In recent days, several events in Germany have been cancelled, including the ITB Tourism Fair in Berlin, as well as a major book fair in Leipzig. In Western Germany, as well as Berlin, several schools and daycare centers have closed, some for weeks after staff members tested positive. Here at the Charity Hospital, the first coronavirus patient in Berlin is being treated in isolation. Health officials say he had contact to at least 60 individuals. All are being tested. The hospital has set up a pandemic response plan to prepare for the worst case scenario. 
He had completely different symptoms that did not point to coronavirus, but according to our double diagnosis, testing all patients for the past week, we discovered it. Some experts have criticized the hospital authorities for the handling of the case. Due to his unusual symptoms, hospital staff initially focused on neurological tests and sent the man home soon after. Only when the coronavirus test came out positive did they put him in isolation. At a meeting on migration on Monday, German Chancellor Angela Merkel was refused a handshake by German Interior Minister Horst Seehofer. He had previously told reporters he had stopped offering handshakes amid the outbreak. Reporting by Christian Watchen, NCD News, Berlin. Coming up this week, schools all across the nation are celebrating Read Across America. It kicks off every year on Dr. Seuss's birthday. Take a look at how one school is celebrating reading after the break. have described China Uncensored like the Daily Show, but about China. In China, something can be illegal, but still in common practice. For example, bribery or intellectual property theft or Uber. Well, at the beginning, I was super excited when I got 500 views. And now the show's grown to about half a million subscribers on YouTube. One episode reached 7.9 million people and counting. I'm a little freaked out that that many people have seen my face. Hey, have you heard of China Uncensored? It's starring me. It's more and more obvious that China is having a major influence on the U.S. Hey, have you heard of China Uncensored? Zhongguo Jamie. In five years, I see China Uncensored as the only show on TV or the internet. It will be the sole source of edutainment worldwide. Have you heard of China Uncensored? Yeah, I actually, I have, you actually I have? have? He's heard of China uh, Uncensored. I love uh. China Uncensored. <laughs> This week in classrooms all across the nation, kids are reading and rhyming while they learn about the legacy of Dr. Seuss. Read Across America Week kicks off every year on Dr. Seuss's birthday on March 2nd. His first children's book was published in the late 30s. Even today, many kids still connect to his humorous literature. St. Michael's School here in New York City is just one school across America that's celebrating Read Across America Day in honor of what would be Dr. Seuss's 116th birthday. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them stand. What is your favorite book by Dr. Seuss? Um, the Cat and the Hat. Really? Why? Yes. Because it, it rhymes and, and every single time I read it, it's funny. Dr. Seuss published his first children's book in 1937. Then after a 1954 article was published reporting about school children who couldn't read, his goal became making reading interesting. 66 years later, his books are still among the most interesting to young readers. It's really funny. It has lots of rhymes and it makes it fun to read. And for the older kids, the national celebration gives them time to reflect on how important literacy is. Reading just applies to life in general. Like, so, like, one may not think about it, but reading is just always there. Reading helps your, like, imagination and, like, your literature. Thinking about futures, one common way to celebrate Read Across America is to bring in community leaders, letting role models encourage and inspire kids through reading. As a firefighter or a police officer or, you know, maybe you're in another profession that the children may look up to, um, I think it's good just to reach out to show them that, you know, you're, you're just like everybody else, you know. Reading celebrations like these have continued every year since the National Education Association launched the initiative in 1998 to encourage reading habits. And what better way to motivate young readers than to celebrate one of the authors they enjoy most? Melina Weiskup, NTD News, New York. 
What a great way to start the week back at school. Some kids might even have tried green eggs and ham for lunch. And coming up, a career opportunity that's out of this world. NASA is hiring its next batch of astronauts. Find out what it takes to apply when we return. special for us. Bring your family, let your children experience this. I know my daughter just loves it. When the curtain first opened, I looked out at her face and she was amazed by what she saw. It's great for the whole family. And I have a granddaughter. I want her to see something like this because it'll probably enrich her soul and her development as a person. It would change her life. It's hard for kids to listen to parents all the time, but when they hear it from an outside influence as well, reinforcing your values, that's great. Oh, it's so beautiful. And her birthday was Friday, so we surprised her with tickets. I was just so amazed. They're amazing, amazing dancers. The girls are so elegant and beautiful, and the colors are amazing. It's just amazing. It's truly breathtaking. Just the story, the story behind everything as well, which is amazing. There's so much culture. It's a bridge between meditation and peace and where we are now in our busy lives. As an adult and a teacher, it's awesome to see kids reacting and having that positive reaction to the show. I will see it next year and year after that and the year after that. It is just incredible, absolutely beautiful. I wish I could see it again, like, right now. Tokyo's Olympic 2020 organizer says its contract would allow it to put off the games until the end of the year, while the International Olympic Committee continues to prepare for the event. Potential disruption to this summer's Olympic Games in Tokyo amid concerns over the coronavirus continues to be discussed in Japan, with lawmakers examining the terms of the contract with the International Olympic Committee. Current terms state that a postponement can be allowed until the end of the year with Japan's Olympics minister saying on Tuesday they are looking into various possibilities. It only says if the Games are not to be held within 2020. It depends on how this is interpreted, but it can be read as allowing a postponement within 2020. However, Japan's government and host city were still committed to hosting the Games due to begin on July 24th. And under the hosting agreement, it was still made clear the right to cancel the games belongs to the IOC. We all are healthy and looking forward to the meeting. Head of that organisation, Thomas Back, stressed on Tuesday that preparations were still underway for a successful games in Tokyo. Any halt to the games would be costly. The latest budget is $12.5 billion, with Japan's government already providing funds to build the Olympic Stadium and contributing towards the cost of the 2020 Paralympics. To curb the spread of the virus, Japan's government has asked schools to close and encourage the curtailment of events that could attract large crowds, including last week's Tokyo Marathon. Are you looking for a career that is out of this world, literally? NASA is looking for its next class of astronauts. The application process is open from now until March 31st, among the requirements, you a citizenship and a master's degree in one of the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, or math. But the master's degree requirement can be met in several other ways, too. Candidates must also pass NASA's long-duration spaceflight physical. NASA currently has 48 astronauts. A handful of new ones will be hired for the astronaut corps and begin training. These Artemis generation astronauts could end up on the International Space Station or future plant missions to the Moon and Mars. And that's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. Join us again tonight. I'm Tiffany Meyer.